welcome you to the ONC and LOINC, a look at the future of health IT standards and lab interoperability. And we to kick this off, I'm going to stop sharing and present, if I can, I've lost my um, Zoom control, so I do apologize for that. I will find them and fix it in just a moment. Um, but we have Avinash Shambhag, Vishale Patel, Tracy Akubo, Dan Chaput, and Rachel Abbey to present to us today. So Avinash, the floor is yours, and I will figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Sure. Sure. Thank you, April. And, and just to make sure that everybody can hear me, can somebody uh, give me a thumbs up? We can hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Great. Great. Thank you very much. And, and, and let's see if I can filibuster enough for April to get her Zoom to work. <laughs> We're good. I see Tracy's screen Ex now. Excellent. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Avinash Shanbhag, uh, the Acting Executive Director in the Office of Technology at ONC. Uh, I'm here with two of my esteemed colleagues, uh, Vaishali Patel, who leads our data analysis branch. Uh, and Tracy Akubo, who's our lead for uh, many of our cooperative agreements uh, with standards organization, and particularly one with LOINC that we'll be, she'll be talking with. And we also have a couple of uh, experts uh, from ONC, particularly uh, in the public health arena. We have Dan Chaput and Rachel Abbey. Uh, just as, as, as you know, we finish it and, and questions come up, they will be certainly available to provide uh, any, any thoughts. So we have, we have a full slew of ONC folks in here. And, and again, uh, thank you to uh, both uh, the LOINC uh, team for uh, having us here. And thank you for all the participants who have, who are, who are still here and, 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 and listening to this session, the final session before your virtual happy hour, wherever it is. So thank you again. So I'll start, I'll start with just kind of like, you know, saying a few words before I turn over to, to my colleagues who will actually go through uh, details with some of the areas that ONC and our colleagues from LOINC have worked and with other folks. Uh, I'll start off by just, again, acknowledging the, the work that LOINC has done and, and, and again, appreciating the foundational standards activity uh, that ONC supports. And we think it is, it's, it's particularly important, uh, both in the context of supporting the nationwide healthcare interoperability, and particularly in, in this uh, situation in the current pandemic where, uh, again, the foundation for, for a rapid testing, foundation for, for ensuring that, uh, that healthcare uh, is, is provided and is available to public health is really dependent on some of the, the, the hard work that uh, the team at Regan Street does. And also all the participants here uh, are, are really supportive of, because again, standards development is not just a, an organization's activity. It really requires a community to support it. And, and we are very thankful for, uh, for that work. And, and again, from an ONC's perspective, I think I'm speaking to the choir here, but uh, we've had uh, very strong engagement with the standards community again, from our certification program uh, where we have had uh, the standards, terminology standards, including LOINC being part of our certification program for many years since 2012 uh, certification uh, program, uh, we have had LOINC as part of our activities uh, and particularly in our current QS rule, uh, we have established as uh, again, many of you are aware the United States core data for interoperability set of standards uh, that are the standard data elements uh, for supporting interoperability over the across uh, different healthcare setting also has a strong foundational uh, basis in terminology standards, including LOINC. So all in all, Again, it's, we think it's a foundational activity that is pre-competitive and supportive of all the, the, the national interest and I would say the international interest also. Uh, additionally, uh, again, you know, in, in, I, I would say in terms of making our, our engagement much more formalized uh, over the, I should say over the past two years, uh, ONC has had also a strong uh, uh, formal relationship with the cooperative agreement with LOINC in which uh, we've had, we were again, uh, able to both support LOINC and also on, 
on, on, on the flip side, the Loing team was able to uh, support many of ONC's uh, needs. And again, ONC translating that to nation's needs, uh, particularly with some of the rapid uh, just development of rapid codes uh, to in, in, in light of the current pandemic that the lawing team was able to support and provide uh, to, the, to, to, to the nation. So again, it's, 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 it's exciting uh, for us to be here. Uh, we continue and we want to continue to, to, to be uh, strong supporters and, and uh, uh, ensure that uh, this, the, the standards uh, activity is got a strong foundation uh, through both our financial support to the extent we are able to provide uh, and also bringing to, uh, to, to this group uh, some of the, the challenges, uh, things that uh, again from ONC's point of view and again in a unique setting that ONC is, we are able to kind of bring to this group some of the, the, the challenges and opportunities that we see uh, as common problems that require uh, a larger group, a, a, a national group for to, to, to be able to, uh, to overcome. So with that, I'm going to, again, you know, the way we've, we've kind of divided the, the session, uh, we'll have uh, Vaishali Patel, as I said, who leads our measurement activity, discuss some of the interesting uh, results of, of our analysis and, and reports of, of, of just the state of interoperability and, and particularly focusing on labs and, and, and some of the opportunities uh, in, in, in those areas discuss uh, initially. And then uh, again, as a back end, we'll have a Tracy Akubo who'll, who'll kind of like, you know, take it over and, and, and again, translate that into some of the action items that uh, we are working together with the lawing team to, to kind of make progress and, 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 and help uh, move the ball forward. And then we'll, we'll hopefully uh, as a group uh, come back and, 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 and try to identify any additional areas from this uh, present after this presentation to to see if there are other activities that we also need to focus on. But very excited uh, to be able to hear from you all. So please send your questions in the Q and A, and hopefully we'll get to that uh, uh, by having enough time after the, the 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 set of presentations we have. So with that, I'm going to turn over to my colleague Vaishali Patel first. Uh, to, to go through some of her observations uh, from, from, from the work we did in summer uh, to, to, to move forward. So Vaishali, to you. Yep. Great, thanks. Tracy, would you mind moving two slides forward? Thanks. So as um, Avinash noted, I'm here to talk about both their past and current approaches to measuring the state of lab interoperability and sharing with you um, insights and some of the approaches that we've taken to date and also providing food for thought for a uh, potential future measurement as well. So um, first, uh, back in 2012, ONC conducted first national survey of clinical laboratories, um, specifically the survey focused on hospital labs as well as independent labs, including LabCorp and Quest. And this, the focus of the survey in terms of content was on assessing lab capabilities um, to electronically exchange um, in a structured format and also looking at the levels of electronic exchange that were occurring based on volume of lab test results. We also asked about standards as well as barriers uh, in the survey as well and I'll share with you some some of the key findings from from that work. Um, since then you know we haven't until very recently we haven't really done much in the way of measurement as it relates to um, laboratory exchange from the perspective of labs. Um, we have looked at laboratory exchange from the perspective of healthcare providers and clinicians. So in our surveys of hospitals, national surveys of hospitals and physicians, we've asked about that from their perspective. Um, so um, more recently, back in 2019, prior to you know, the COVID pandemic, 
um, based on discussions that we had with our some of our federal partners, including those at the CDC, uh, ONC's um, federal advisory groups, um, our standards um, advisory group specifically, as well as our grantees, we we identified that you know there may be some uh, challenges related to lab interoperability that might warrant measurement, you know, and so what we wanted to do was um, uh, engage in a project that would help us identify current issues in lab interoperability since so much time had passed since the 2012 survey that we engaged in and to make recommendations around specific approaches uh, to, to measurement for the specific areas that were identified as warranting further uh, measurement and investigation. And so, um, so that was one aspect that was, again, it, it, you know, the idea behind it began in 2019. And then um, in 2020, um, given the pandemic, uh, we also determined that there would be a need to further explore lab interoperability within the context of health information exchange organizations, as well as public health reporting. And so a separate project uh, focused on looking at identifying opportunities and barriers related to health information exchange organizations, um, potentially supporting public health in order to enhance um, lab interoperability and exchange of information to support contact tracing, public health surveillance, and other related activities. Um, so next slide. So in terms of the specific um, projects that we embarked on, um, so the first project, as I mentioned, you know, focused on, you know, general challenges associated with lab interoperability and identifying specific areas that would warrant measurement. And so um, NORC at the University of Chicago led this work and they were also um, uh, the contractors that ONC worked with in doing the national level survey back in 2012. So they have a lot of expertise in, they, in this area. They did a targeted literature review and environmental scan and they also interviewed 20, you know, 20, more than 20 individuals um, who were representatives from lab associations, clinical labs, public health organizations, from our federal advisory committee who were on that standards, um, on the standards side, um, as well as HEO representatives, uh, federal partners at the CDC, um, um, representatives um, at Regenstrief, um, as well as other subject matter experts in this area. And um, the work began in March, even though the, the concept, as I mentioned, um, started, you know, back in 2019. And so, you know, given the start of the pandemic at around that time, coincidentally, you know, we, we decided to make sure that we included the public health component as a part of that work as well. So, because in the past we had focused on just hospital labs, as I mentioned, and independent labs. And so we, we also wanted to make sure that the findings here would be relevant in the public health lab space and for public health more generally. Um, and so that work um, commenced in March of this year and ended um, in June. And then the second project, um, which was led by uh, a different organization, Leap Orbit, really focused on a subset of the issues that the first project kind of focused on. And this, this, this second project really focused on the role of health information exchange organizations to support public health and in relation to lab data exchange. Um, and since there are a number of complex issues around that specifically, we felt that that was an important area to focus on, again, you know, as it relates to informing future work related to, um, you know, the pandemic. 
And so that consisted of interviews with eight health information exchange organization leaders, and there were multiple interviews done. And those, those health information exchange entities were selected because they had been successful in supporting COVID-19 response with lab data specifically. And then the technology vendors are the technology vendors specific to labs that um, were used by those eight organizations. So it was very tightly kind of um, woven together in terms of trying to understand what does it take to really support um, for health information exchange entities to support um, lab exchange um, for public health purposes and whether we can apply some of the lessons learned more broadly. And so I'll be presenting on both of these um, uh, projects um, subsequent to this. And one other um, area I wanted to mention is that uh, in August um, at the Tech Forum, which is like ONC's, um, one of ONC's premier events, um, we had a session um, that focused on uh, lab interoperability and addressing barriers to lab interoperability that included um, Swapna from Regan Street. We had representatives from the FDA, from um, NLM, as well as from our Health IT Advisory Committee. And, uh, you know, some of the issues that were raised there and some of the approaches to address those issues will be be brought up um, later on when when Tracy presents as well but I wanted to kind of raise that as well um, next slide please so in terms of some of the key findings from back in the 2012 survey which is to date like the only national level data that I'm aware of that's nationally representative of um, both hospital labs as well as independent labs. Um, we found that about two thirds of those labs um, reported that they had the capability to electronically exchange um, and send structured results to an EHR. So, which was encouraging, you know, at that time, you know, when we were considering, um, you know, meaningful, meaningful use measures um, that related to lab exchange, it was, it was encouraging to know that, you know, at that point back in 2012, that two thirds of the labs at least possessed that capability in place to support, to support physicians, um, to lab exchange with physicians. And then what we found was um, we actually wanted to assess beyond capability, you know, what labs were actually doing. So of the two thirds or 67% of labs that reported that they had possessed those capabilities, eight and 10 reported that they actually were um, sending, you know, results um, electronically in a structured, structured format to an EHR. And this did vary by you know, when we looked at by type of type of um, lab and the size of the lab, and you know, we have a separate analysis and paper that we published on that topic um, that I'd be happy to share the reference to if folks if folks are interested um, after the meeting um, after this presentation. Um, next slide, please. So this this. Um, Another key measure that we wanted to look at was not just the capability and whether labs themselves were engaging in electronically sending test results in a structured format, but looking at just the volume of test results. So the denominator in here is not labs, it's the actual, um, the volume of test results. So what percentage of test results were being sent electronically in a structured format in 2012. And so because, you know, because there are large labs and small labs and, you know, the dominance of certain labs in the market, we wanted to have a broader sense of, well, you know, in terms of test volume, what are we looking at in terms of interoperability and exchange? 
And what we found, as you see here, is that 58% of, um, test, of, of test results were sent electronically and in a structured format in 2012. And one would hope that that number is, you know, close to 100% or, you know, at this stage, although we don't know for sure. And, you know, I think during this pandemic, as point of care testing has become uh, more common, we know that that's not the case. Um, but um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the subsequent slides. Um, so the next slide, please. So from, you know, what, what I've done here is integrate the findings from the two different projects um, into, you know, some common themes that we found from the two sets of projects. Um, this particular um, finding is, 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 you know, is a theme that emerged in, in both, um, both projects. Um, and, you know, which is, lab interoperability currently, so not thinking back in 2012, this is a 2020 finding, is, is still a rather complex and resource intensive process for labs. Um, you know, some of the issues relate, that were cited, relate to the granularity and complexity of long coding, which can make it challenging for clinicians to code consistently. Um, Additionally, there are a number, you know, resources um, required to map link codes, and that continues to remain uh, an issue. That was something that we measured actually back in 2012 as part of the survey, and it's, it came up again in these qualitative um, findings as well. It's a resource-intensive process that requires training and expertise and time, and, you know, which certain types of labs may not possess, you know, they might not have the bandwidth to, to keep up. Um, additionally, um, labs are also, in terms of resource intensiveness, um, you know, maintain these HL7 interfaces, um, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of them, depending obviously on the size of the lab with ordering providers. And again, maintaining that is a resource intensive process. Um, and, you know, where do we see the future with regards to this? Um, you know, investments have already been made into these interfaces, um, you know, which are kind of these one-off type um, types of exchange. And that may limit updates to, to newer standards unless the newer standards provide something of great value to the labs. And so, you know, at least, for now, I think we can expect that these HL7 interfaces will likely remain for at least for the near term. And so in terms of the implications for the use of newer standards such as FHIR, um, to date, you know, it seems like it's largely limited to sharing of test results directly with patients. And um, I would caveat that by saying that, you know, it's the lab core and the quests of the world at least that you know we found from these qualitative interviews that are engaging in those efforts um, whereas most other kinds of labs are primarily using patient portals that are available through um, you know uh, providers um, rather than trying to directly provide results through you know something like Apple Health Record. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, another common area that was found in terms of findings, in terms of themes were, you know, there are challenges, widespread challenges with the electronic lab reporting. Um, you know, this is not necessarily an interoperability problem on the part of labs, but labs are report that they are missing key information, demographic information primarily to support adequate public health surveillance. And obviously that has implications for contact tracing. Um, now, in relation to that, um, you know, HIEs, you know, and this is where the connection starts coming in, 
is HIEs um, can potentially play a role in filling the gaps that relate to that kind of demographic information, missing demographic information. And again, I'll be talking about that a little bit more in, in, um, in subsequent slides. But so this is an area that we wanted to flag um, as um, really relevant to public health and, and something that we all need to kind of grapple with and work on together. Additionally, um, public health labs and health departments reported that they lack resources to establish the HL7 interfaces and upgrade to new HL7 formats. Um, you know, the electronic lab reporting varies widely um, and they have multiple reporting systems across the different public health labs and methods for doing it. And so there's not a lot of consistency um, across the public health departments and labs with regards to this, which makes it, again, just a little bit more, makes it a little bit more difficult. Additionally, as I mentioned, you know, the expansion of the point of care testing um, has led to more manual reporting and just manual processes that I think we're probably, this audience is probably well aware of, and which makes difficult um, reporting, interpreting lab to test results downstream, you know, on the part of the public health labs and the health departments. Um, so not limited to just public health labs, but some of the issues, we, we also identified issues that, you know, are relate to hospital and commercial labs as well and and you know issues um, with electronic lab reporting that they shared um, this you know this specifically relates to the limitations of the vendor codes to capture public health data and um, again resource intensive efforts um, to put together kind of to support the standardized reporting that's necessary. And there's also a bit of confusion and maybe some education needed around um, what is required in terms of specimens to send to public health labs um, for additional testing and in, in addition to reporting um, results to public health. So again, these, these are not necessarily interoperability issues again, but could relate more to you know, education and outreach and coming up with more streamlined processes. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, HIEs have a potential role to play in supporting lab exchange for public health purposes. However, they're what we found in interviews, separate interviews with labs, as well as um, the HIEs, is that they're differing perspectives as to why currently the role of HIEs is limited. Um, from the lab perspective, um, you know, they report that there are technical issues which limit their engagement with labs. Um, that includes concerns around, you know, appropriate patient matching, um, whether HIEs are up to the task of reconciling multiple lab test result statuses, um, whereas HIEs consider those things as, you know, um, capabilities that they're um, well positioned and well able to do. So there are different differing perspectives on that. Additionally, HIEs cited that um, they felt that labs were narrowly interpreting some of the um, regulatory um, requirements around, you know, whether it's permitted to share some of this inform, you know, this laboratory data with um, with HIEs. Um, they considered that the H the labs were potentially narrowly interpreting some of the HIPAA treatment payment and healthcare operation activities and potentially misinterpreting CLEAR requirements. Um, some of the HIEs reported that, that um, labs were requiring HIEs to provide um, individual level consents from providers that are participating in their HIE, um, which um, they considered you know, pretty burdensome and not necessary. So 
again, differing perspectives on this. Um, certainly, we know there are a number of different complex set of <laughs> federal, state, and, you know, requirements around, you know, the sharing of health information, and it varies state by state. So these are issues that require some navigation. Additionally, labs reported as a barrier that the fees that are associated with participating in a health information exchange entity um, would preclude some labs from uh, participating and therefore sharing data um, through health information exchange entities. Well, whereas HIEs report that they do have different payment models, some of which do not charge labs a fee. Um, and finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, labs already have invested, um, you know, quite a bit of resources into these interfaces that they have directly with providers. So the value uh, proposition for basically, you know, potentially setting aside those interfaces that they've already invested in versus, you know, leveraging an HIE, you know, um, you know, the sharing the data through the HIE may not be as appealing or, you know, seem as valuable. And so uh, engagement on the part of labs may be limited because of those investments. Um, next slide. Um, a fourth key finding was that the benefit of HIEs for public health um, reporting does vary. Um, you know, HIEs may receive reportable lab results from hospital labs, regional and local labs, as well as commercial labs. And then, you know, some of those do send electronic lab um, uh, reports to public health departments and or the CDC on the behalf of the lab if they have that pre-established kind of contractual relationship with, you know, the, the public health um, agencies, um, you know, um, but, you know, it also, you know, and it also depends on if they have those interfaces um, be between themselves and the public health agencies. And again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, public health departments may not have and labs may not have the resources required to for those interfaces. Um, and um, in terms of like services that you know, HIEs offer, they, they can provide like an additional set of services to public health. You know, um, as I mentioned, you know, it, it could be re in related to um, addressing those gaps in information, you know, the demographic information that might be missing. It could be related to analytics as well. Um, but that, you know, the privacy policy under public health surveillance for reportable conditions um, vary state by state. So, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, these are issues that um, HIEs are going to have to grapple with um, across by state um, and whether the data will be accessible or not to HIEs, you know, in some states it's stricter than in others. And um, Dan Chaput, uh, my colleagues Dan Chaput and Rachel Abbey can speak more detail about this if there are any questions in relation to this. Um, next slide. Um, and finally, um, the key, you know, the last sort of key finding, you know, from across these two studies is that, you know, the, the, the technical inner innovations in terms of, you know, these health information exchange opportunities, but there, but there are challenges and that, uh, and as I mentioned, um, you know, HIEs, because of their master patient index and the richness of the data that they have available on patients, not only just the demographic information that I mentioned, but they have information on diagnoses and other health conditions that, you know, a patient might have that link together with a lab test result could provide a very rich set of data for public health agencies to better understand, um, not only for contact tracing, but also just to, to better understand, you know, the, 
the individuals that are being, um, you know, that have positive results and, you know, what factors are associated with them. Um, however, to fully realize the potential of kind of linking this rich set of data with the lab data to public health agencies is that the lab data really needs to be more standardized and, you know, really leverage LOINC um, more fully. Um, one of the issues that was flagged was that, you know, HIEs, because they work with a number of different labs, if, if they are doing that within their communities, one of the things that they're noticing is that labs are, have their own, each lab has their own way of doing, you know, their coding. Um, and so that's a challenge for them. You know, again, it's a resource intensive endeavor if they're not using a standard set of codes. Um, and being able to leverage that for public health. And then finally, as I'll, I'll reiterate again, you know, HIE standing with respect to state and federal laws governing the exchange of lab data, both during a public health emergency, as well as just, you know, regularly will continue to be an issue. Um, and that's something that I think, um, you know, will, will be a, will be an issue, you know, in the, in the long term and, and um, something that has to be dealt with on a state by state basis. Um, next slide, please. And finally, kind of more, more specific to LOINC and, and this audience, you know, I think potential future areas of measurement that are specific to LOINC that would be of interest to ONC is you know, being able to assess, um, you know, uh, at a future time, you know, the, the, whether the, the complexity of exchange diminishes, um, you know, is the time, expertise, and level of effort and resources required to use LOINC, um, particularly mapping of LOINC codes. Um, does that is, is that decreasing over time? Is the perception regarding the complexity and granularity of long coding, which may make it challenging to code consistently, is that diminishing over time? Um, and, and helping um, users uh, with some of the uncertainty about which specific long code to use because there may be more than one code that appear to be similar. Um, and also just the availability and uses of resources that might be available to better make use of LOINC, whether that's best practices or guidance and resources. And this is an area that Tracy will be talking about. Um, and then finally, just the timely availability of LOINC codes. Is that, again, is, is the responsiveness of, of um, being able to generate codes, particularly during a pandemic, um, you know, um, being addressed, you know, very quickly, um, you know. Uh, so these are areas that I think, you know, we'd be interested in measuring and that are more specific to, that came from some of the work that was done and is more specific to the audience, but we did want to share these broader set of findings that are not necessarily related to LOINC at all, but really are re more relevant to just us thinking about lab interoperability more broadly and um, the role of, um, or you know, our efforts to try to identify issues to support um, public health and lab exchange um, during the time of this pandemic. So I will now hand it over to Tracy to, to talk about some of these issues and what, what um, Regan Streif and LOINC together with ONC are, are doing um, to address some of the issues that have been identified. Thanks, Vashali. And I apologize in advance if you hear birds in the background, that is me. Um, I have parakeets, as most of my colleagues at ONC know. Um, Tracy, so could thank I pause you. for just a moment and ask you? Sure. To we do have a few questions, but do we want to wait for you? Sure. It, sounds like, it sounds like you may have some um, a continuation of this session, so we can either do some questions now or do them all at the end. So I'll leave that up to you guys. 
I would recommend we just do it at the end. Let Tracy speak. Um, that way we know that Tracy has enough time to kind of go through her slides. And it may be that some of the questions may be answered by through Tracy's presentation. Excellent. Thank so. you. Okay, we can do that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to present um, the work that ONC has been doing alongside with Regan Street to support health IT standards and interoperability in the lab space. Um, I, I was able to present an update back in the spring conference in March and very happy that my colleagues were able to join me today for the fall conference update. Um, so, Um, as mentioned in, in the March update, in 2018, we did award a sole source cooperative agreement to Regan Street Institute to enhance the LOIC standard to support U.S. interoperability. It was awarded in 2018 for a five-year period of performance. Uh, the initial award amount was $600,000, but uh, over the past two fiscal years, we've been able to continue to supplement at about $500,000 a year. Um, the purpose of this cooperate agreement really had two key objectives. The first one was looking at Regan Streif and Loink's technical infrastructure, uh, recognizing that there were needs to upgrade those technical infrastructure, um, and being able to expedite those improvements and able to allow the Loink developer community and users to be able to access the content, as well as looking ahead and knowing that we would need to start to bridge that gap between LOINC and HL7 FIRE, um, some of those things that you heard uh, Shali present about. The other objective under this cooperative agreement was to be able to rapidly advance the production of FIRE-based terminology for LOINC. Looking forward again uh, towards what the next step is in interoperability through 21st Century Cures Rule and the upcoming uh, USCVI. Um, again, supporting Lloyd to develop the content for the USCDI, as well as updating any of the other additional tools that Regan Streif maintains, including uh, the Regan Streif Link Mapping Assistant, or RELMA. So in alignment, uh, some of the key objectives that we talked about uh, for the 2018 cooperative agreement, and the alignment that we have found through the measure, measuring measurement work that Vaishali and her team has led, we have found that there are uh, definite alignments and some of these findings that came after we started the cooperative agreement also helped validate that where we had identified challenges or where we identified that we could support Regan Street to help upgrade LOINC and the user community were actually in the right direction that we should have been looking at. So uh, some of the things that we, that Vashali had presented on about uh, the granularity and the complexity and the resource intensiveness of light codes and mapping services. Uh, so some of the things that we've been able to address through the cooperative agreement to date have been able to provide those additional resources and mapping guides. Um, Assistance with selecting the correct code, again, something that we've heard uh, through the measurement work that we have also been able to address over the past couple of years to the cooperative agreement. And then the availability of guidance and resources through the web search capabilities. Um, a lot of these things we have been working on over the past two years, obviously through the uh, upgrading of the technical infrastructure, uh, moving over from the legacy systems to some of the newer systems. And you saw the release of a lot of these new technical and web upgrades in June of June 17th when Loink released Loink 2.68 and Realm 7.1. Uh, so this is just a brief list of some of the key accomplishments to date. A lot of this um, we've spoken to in terms of how it has built fit into and supported uh, the upgrades and services that have helped make the LOINC user site and LOINC search usability much easier for LOINC content developers as well as the LOINC user community. 
And each year under the cooperative agreement, uh, Regents Truth is also asked to do an environmental scan so that we are making sure that the user community is being properly supported and that we are addressing the needs of the community. So uh, the environmental scan that was conducted at the conclusion of 2019, based on the environmental scan report, we looked at the key areas where we felt that there were still areas that we could focus our priority and start to close that gap further. And these were the priorities that came out of uh, the environmental scan that Regan Street and ONC jointly discussed and agreed upon. Um, at the time of this discussion, we weren't in a full-blown global pandemic at that point, but uh, given like role in the testing space, obviously they were already starting to see the intake of the uptake of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the workload increase that comes along with that. I believe at the time, by early March, uh, they had already seen a 30% a level of effort shift to focus and address the need to support SARS-CoV-2 test kit production. Uh, so the other things that um, we had prioritized for 2020, um, which also aligns with the findings that the Shelley's measurement work has identified were web page enhancements, education and outreach, and updating the link content. Um, moving forward, a few months later, uh, we were able to secure some additional monies through the CARES Act, and we were able to put aside another $1.5 million to Regan Street to support their work and their efforts in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic and just broadening our support and help in the public health space in general. So we awarded just about three weeks ago, the accelerating and expanding launch development to support interoperable public health reporting. Also a five-year period of performance at $1.5 million. Our official kickoff call is actually next week. Uh, the three key objectives that we are looking for out of this cooperative agreement, uh, number one, obviously, is to support the rapid development of SARS-CoV-2 linked code development and associated mapping services, um, upgrading the technical infrastructure that support the in vitro diagnostic manufacturers or IVD manufacturers, labs, and other uh, entities in this testing space. And then finally, terminology standardization, um, aligning with, again, with the findings from the measurement about decreasing turnarounds to generate for new link codes. But also uh, speaking to some of the other findings um, that Vashali had presented on about um, you know, standardization within coding, we've also heard from others within the community um, standardization of terminology and terminology usage. Um, the concerns about the disconnect between HIEs and labs and public health agencies, uh, the need to work with the different federal agencies like the CDC and the FDA. So state court coordination obviously is another big area that we felt could be addressed under this cooperative agreement. So one of the things that we are going to be working on in addition to ramping up the SARS-CoV-2 test kits like code development, mapping services, and technical infrastructure is working with our stakeholders on the federal side, CDC, FDA, um, NIH potentially, as well as other stakeholders that are users, um, test orderers, and you know, pub like the American Public Health Laboratory Association of Public Health Labs and the ASTO Association for State and Territory Health Officials. So we're really trying to pull in uh, the state, the local uh, federal entities to start to try to pull together and bring that standardization to, to fruition. Uh, so with that, <laughs> um, that is the current state. Um, our future efforts and the role of measurement within the work that we're doing with ONC and Regan Street in partnership. Um, 
A number of the challenges obviously relate to lab interoperability are specific to LOINC, uh, but they're already being addressed through ONC's cooperative agreements. Um, and we're very happy to be able to support them in these efforts. Ideally, uh, we'd like to reduce the level of effort and complexity associated with the lab interoperability. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting, but it does take time and there, as you can see, are many different complexities and factors that build into these challenges. Um, the measurement efforts do indicate um, addressing other issues are needed in order to advance lab interoperability and that it requires engagement across a variety of stakeholders. But future measurement may be needed in order to assess progress and the impact of our collective efforts to support and advance lab interoperability. And with thank that, you. we can now turn it over for questions. Thank, thank you, Tracy. Sorry, there was a cue for me to jump in. This is Avinash again. If you could go back one slide back, uh, just to kind of... Uh, Summarize. So, you know, I appreciate it. So thank you, Vaishali and, and Tracy. I know before we open for questions, uh, there were a bunch of questions about uh, uh, the, the, the funding of, of various activities. I think uh, Tracy did a good job of explaining that, again, ONC is supportive of, of ensuring uh, any, you know, appropriate funding that we are able to uh, award to, to be provided to, to you know, uh, activities to that will help us interoperate in this space. So we, as Tracy mentioned, we have provided additional supplementary funding to the LOINC team and also wanted to mention that recently ONC awarded uh, a bunch of HIEs under the STAR HIE program of a cooperative agreement uh, to fund for some of their enhanced ability to connect with additional data sources, including labs. So this is all exciting work, but there's a lot more to be unpacked. I wanted to turn over, I know there are a bunch of, bunch of question answers that got answered uh, via the Q&A, but I wanted to see if uh, uh, the line team wants uh, us to read through the questions and answer, or, 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 or should we kind of, you know, uh, go through that list? Uh, how do you want us to proceed on those questions, April or uh, Jennifer? So, well. This is April, um, and I believe one of our team members is fielding the questions to you. I realize that you guys have answered several of them. And that is fantastic, but we thought we would, A, there's a few extras, um, there's another question and a couple of comments, um, but also to further the discussion on the questions that you did answer, um, we can open that up a little bit as well. Um, so um, let's see, uh, I'm not sure, I forget who from our team is um, doing questions. But, but do we want to take that first question that's still unanswered? I mean, the only yes. question that right now that's still unanswered because yes. I um, it'd be we good to have that. like the team, maybe Avinash. This this might be this might be you. <laughs> so the current um, unanswered question is: Will support for um, I think it's supposed to be fire. Fire, yeah. yeah. Fire APIs include ensuring such lab result APIs are CLIA compliant. Um, in HL7, O and O still trying, uh, orders and observables, I believe, still trying to get fire resources, such as diagnostic reports, able to support real world lab result reporting so it can be used. Not aware of any lab information systems in the US that can support fire yet for lab results reporting. That was a lot, so I can repeat pieces. Hey, no, no worries. Hey, this is Avinash. I was muted, so no, no, I, I have the question here. So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we'll definitely take it back to HL7 while again, uh, you know, just from a high level perspective, we, we are all uh, uh, fairly bullish on uh, having APIs to be able to uh, give access to the information and be able to be used for access. Definitely, you know, when it comes to uh, specific uh, uh, nuances, uh, we would want the community to be kind of engaged with. And again, uh, similar to how we have uh, uh, engagement with LOINC, uh, we also uh, are deeply engaged uh, with HL7 uh, to make sure that uh, uh, 
uh, all the standards uh, activities do do kind of uh, uh, align well. So so while I think uh, as as the uh, astute observation is here that uh, uh, HL7 fire resources are still using diagnostic reports and 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 are not you know have have not yet uh, moved forward into into uh, uh, the the, the sp clear space. We we are and we we would definitely be uh, encouraging uh, that activity. I think interestingly, as I think there was a question on about. Apple Health record and uh, uh, whether lab data is there, and 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 the fact that some of the lab uh, lab infrastructures and 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 lab testing uh, uh, testers are also uh, actually providing uh, lab data through uh, standard fire interfaces uh, is is encouraging is encouraging and and kind of you know helps us all uh, uh, move towards uh, a consistent. Uh, uh, use of standards across the continuum. So yes, so so long long way of saying that we would like to do that. We will definitely work with the HL7 community and uh, for the for the person who brought the question again. You know, uh, if if there are there, is, there are ways by which uh, uh, ONC can uh, participate, we will we'll definitely be uh, interested. And in, again, labs are in you know lab interoperability lab data is is a high volume high throughput activity that that really uh, would benefit from from uh, 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 input interoperability if it is done seamlessly thank you uh, ted klein has some input to share and i believe i've given you the opportunity to unmute ted yes can you hear me yes we can yes sir hey ted uh hi so um first of all i want to thank Ankh for all the support um it's been wonderful and invaluable um, uh, Ankh is also supporting a terminology effort in HL7, the, uh, the unification of the HL7 terminology and the governance process. Um, the upshot of this relative to the lab reporting and the current um, discussion is that um, all of the material that in past decades has been put out in PDF documents for version two, and in, in the core MIF files for version three and various places in different formats um, is now uh, being available for download um, from HL7 for direct content load into FHIR terminology services so that APIs can surface access to all the content um, uh, for the user community and the interoperability community. And um, this is, uh, I think, kind of key because historically, and I believe even currently, many laboratory interfaces, especially those reporting to public health, are still using uh, version two terminologies uh, from HL7. So all of that is now um, captured in fire resources and is uh, consumable um, uh, by the uh, developers who wanna uh, load that information into fire terminology services in their HIEs and in their, their portals and gateways in the public health agencies. And, and I want to thank Ank again for helping to support the development of this because it's long overdue. And, um, and we are, uh, we're, we're running and we're going to do a live announcement. Right now I'm kind of under pressure to get that done by the end of this month, which is in two weeks. So um, thank you very much. And I hope um, this was uh, useful to people. Hey, thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. And 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 should mention, uh, Ted's one of the leads of the Uniform Terminology Governance Project. So thank you for that. And we also have a question on the board from Rob McClure, which which I'll read just so that we have it uh, recorded. If HIEs don't bridge the gap for all labs in all places, what is the suggested solution to get labs to interoperate with EHRs using LOINC? Yes, easy question, Rob. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll start and say that again, you know, we, we expect and we anticipate uh, the, the alignment among all the standards communities, right? Ultimately, it is, it is the combination of interfaces, uh, standard terminologies, and uh, the APIs that are being developed among the different uh, folks and different standards to, to kind of ensure that there is there is uh, interoperability in in uh, and not a point to point solution that that will need to be 
developed. So again, you know, we have the foundational elements. Uh, I think that we are supporting. We we do look upon this group uh, uh, to help move forward uh, and uh, develop both uh, capabilities, uh, but then also uh, I think some of the questions we heard was like, not just the capabilities that make it easy, easier for a labs to be able to uh, develop and, and use those interfaces to use those uh, uh, capabilities uh, so that uh, it doesn't become the cost of, uh, of, of adopting those standards, just, just if, if you can, uh, uh, you know, at least the, my, 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 uh, uh, initial impression would be that if the cost of, of uh, adopting those interfaces and aligning with those standards become less than to maintain those uh, HL7V2 unique interfaces and our uh, uh, local codes, uh, then we'll get a, a, a turning point in uh, the industry being able to support it. And again, I think, you know, uh, not, not very, we are not very familiar with the with the lab space and, 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 and some of the incentives and our needs. But again, take, coming back from the EHR, uh, what we had seen in, in the certification program back in 2015, where we did require APIs uh, to be provided uh, by EHR technologies and health ITs, certified health ITs, but did not make fire as a standard. We did see there was an alignment among, among uh, most of the vendors uh, to to use uh, the standard as opposed to to uh, leveraging their uh, de novo uh, activities again you know knowing that uh, having standards based interfaces uh, did really let them uh, work on additional capabilities and not having to uh, support uh, these one off uh, activities so hopefully rob does that at least that's that's an uh, uh, opinion and 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 hopefully a a, a thought provoking uh, 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 response, but again, open to uh, you know knowing, knowing there are challenges and and uh, ways for us to go forward. Thank you, Avinash. Uh, we don't have any other open questions, but I do want to take a minute or, or a few and go through some of the answered questions that you and Shali uh, were able to address, just to get them on the record, and perhaps if more discussion needs to be had, to put that out there. Um, I'll start with a question. Uh, from John, John Snyder, did the percent of test results that were sent electronically in structured format include results that include an attached PDF report of results from the resulting lab? And Vashali reported structured test results would exclude PDFs, but she could share a copy of the past survey for reference if he was interested. And uh, hello, John, <laughs> by the way. Okay, um, and then a question from Andrea. It's a lengthy question, so I'll, I'll try to get it all correct. How is ONC measuring success in terms of interoperability and identifying when it is achieved? Is it syntactic interoperability, semantic interoperability, etc.? Given most EHRs rarely display the performing lab naming conventions, and information may be lost for downstream users of lab data. Also, the largest CLIA segment of labs, physician office labs, have not been subject to standards as only eligible hospital labs were eligible for meaningful use incentives, as you know. Curious about the scope of success, too, if these are excluded. Um, the answer reported was, for lab interoperability from the perspective of physicians and hospitals, we focused measurement on the capability to electronically exchange laboratory data. We did not specifically ask physicians about semantic interoperability because most physicians are not aware of what LOINC would even be. Standards measurement is best done on the part of more knowledgeable organizations such as vendors and labs. For interoperability generally, we measure the electronic sending, receiving, querying, and, and integrating of information in a seamless manner. Happy to discuss offline, it is a big topic. Um, does that uh, suffice for the answer? Is there more discussion needed there? Uh, okay, hearing, seeing nothing, we'll move on. Um, another question from Andrea that uh, due, due to the complexities and challenges, especially in work implementing the additional COVID data needs as ELRs 
as ELR is the most pervasive messaging available nationally to transmit data to public health and federal agencies, will funding be available to laboratories to assist them with the burdens on top of providing COVID results? Um, and Avinash says, we cannot discuss any additional funding that may be possible in the future, but we understand the need for additional resources are needed across the ecosystem. Um, and then discusses some additional investments from ONC to uh, LOINC to help better support the users. Uh, also awarded funds for HIE via STAR HIE. Uh, and then there's a link for more information and I can populate that into the chat for everybody to see. Uh, Another question, um, do you think that Apple and Google's efforts in developing personal health records with LOINC as a standard will drive the increase in labs priority to map their local codes to LOINC codes? And the response was, we hope so. <laughs> Michelle reports, I hope so. The demand by consumers, healthcare providers, and other end users of the data should drive changes. If there's any discussion that uh, the ONC team wants to provide, please jump in at any time. Sure, so this is Avinash. Maybe this is a good time to like give you a pause. <laughs> uh, <it's> just, <laughs> I appreciate so just a, that. No, 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 just a public service announcement. I mean, uh, you know, again, it's uh, as, as part of the cures uh, rule, we did uh, publish uh, something called the United States Core Data for Interoperability, which is a set of data elements with associated uh, standards, sometimes terminology, uh, it could be a, a combination of terminology and uh, content standards. Uh, just a quick note, uh, you know, as part of the cures rule, we did also come up with a, we, 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 we developed what we called as a public transparent process to upgrade and update the US CDI data elements uh, in a periodic yearly fashion so that uh, there will be more structured information available uh, to be exchanged required of uh, participating uh, certified health ID. Uh, and the open period for this is a continuous process of, of providing information, but I think there is a uh, what we've done is we've given some time slots every year where uh, the data elements uh, that will be that were proposed by stakeholders will be considered by ONC for next round of uh, upgrade. So the current period for consideration for the next version of the US CDI is October 23rd uh, midnight. So again, folks on this, I, I mention it here because uh, this group would be the one that is most acutely uh, knowledgeable in the standard space. So if you are interested, there is a, a website on ONC, uh, on, the, on the ONC Health IT website where uh, you, know, you, can, uh, pop, you can put in uh, your uh, interested data elements uh, for consideration. There is addition, recently we provided additional guidance on how uh, we would evaluate uh, those data elements in the different buckets. And again, I mentioned that because it's coming close uh, to October 23rd and we are looking forward to uh, getting uh, uh, information from the community on what data elements uh, are ready uh, for consideration in the next round. So back to you, April. I thought this was a good time to kind of just again, plug in uh, for that, uh, uh, in, for the interested uh, uh, folks uh, to be able to provide that insight to, to ONC. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to run through a few more answered questions. And again, if anybody wants to jump in to elaborate on either the question or the uh, response, please feel free. Uh, and then there, I see there's a couple more um, comments and other questions that have come in since we've been doing these, but in the interest of not losing my place, I'll continue with these. There's a comment about whether or not labs ha are aware of RELMA and that it dramatically reduces the effort of mapping local codes. Uh, and Michelle reports, we don't know the answer to this, their awareness. Uh, this would have to be measured. It seems that greater awareness of available resources is needed. Uh, and Tracy advised that this could be a potential question for future measurement work. It also validates our decision that education and outreach on LOINC and LOINC resources need to be prioritized, and I most certainly agree with that. Um, there is some, there is a question from Xavier on feedback from ONC on the livid files that manufacturers do publish. I believe there was a follow-up on that. 
um, that it's not necessarily an issue. Livid is a data format standard developed in collaboration with IVD manufacturers for them to publish their LOINC code mapping. Does ONC have feedback on that? Uh, is it helpful, et cetera? Um, and, and, and this is, hey, April, yes. I've not, I think my ris my response to Xavier was thank you for that. Uh, we, uh, we we can certainly look, we have not looked at it. So I personally uh, uh, have not looked at it. I would, so we are certainly uh, uh, interested in looking at it. We'll definitely work with the LOINC team here to to I, to, to, to see how how uh, it is beneficial, useful to the community. So thank you for uh, oh. uh, giving us and that insight. Avinash, I actually uh, responded there. Um, I have actually attended to a few different work group meetings uh, with Livid, <laughs> as, uh, the HL7 meetings, but I, I don't have any strong feelings one way or the other to provide any specific feedback, but definitely it's something we can look at and discuss further at our next check-in with Regan Shreve. Excellent, thank you very much. Yeah, that helps. Thanks, April. Yes, okay. Um, Let's move over to open questions. Um, we have populated the link for USCDI into the chat, so hopefully everybody has gotten that. Um, and Mary Beth says Livid will be discussed at, um, I'm probably going to say this wrong, it's Clea with a C on the end. So <laughs> if that's supposed to be pronounced a certain way, please tell me. Um, John Snyder is asking, what impact, if any, do you think ONC's requirements for payers to adopt FIRE will have on HIE's ability to support FIRE content and thereby laboratory's choice to upgrade to FIRE? Sure, I'll, I'll take that. I think, uh, and, and um, as you, just to kind of clarify, uh, our requirements, so ONC's QoS rule requirements are, are really focused on, uh, on health IT developers that are used by clinicians, so eligible providers, whereas, but you know, CMS has a corresponding uh, uh, rule that requires uh, fire-based APIs for payers. So kind of in a certain sense, uh, generally speaking, uh, I would say like overall as, as a, as a Agency, you know, and ONC and CMS do work very closely, given given our uh, our uh, close alignment with with the tech and the the payment incentive programs. Um, you know, we wish. I, I think it will be. You know, I, I, the 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 future is yet to uh, be clear, but our hope is that with all the alignment among uh, different. Uh, uh, incentive programs and and the requirements coming out of uh, uh, the regulations, uh, there will be a strong uh, alignment among them, and and we'll like to see that the future, uh, in the future, there will be more uh, content that will be exchanged between clinical and uh, administrative information because again, um, you know, it's 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 not a silo, right? I mean, clinical data does. Uh, does require to be uh, be uh, exchanged, interoperated, and be used uh, in in uh, some of the administrative related claims related activities such as uh, prior authorization and and the like. So so we hope that uh, all this effort between uh, both uh, the the expansion of and 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 the active engagement of the standards work and the advancement of the standards uh, between. Uh, HL7, LOINC, IHE, I don't want to forget, uh, NCPDP, all those uh, are, are kind of uh, getting aligned uh, with the expectation again will be that uh, we are hoping that there will be much more uh, standard interfaces that would be uh, accessible to HIEs. And, and again, when we have standard interfaces with standard content, uh, the cost and, and the cost of, of uh, connecting, interoperating and, and using those interfaces go down. So we hope HIEs will be again able to, uh, to, to use those. HIEs are one customers. Uh, we obviously uh, also expect other customers and other uh, entities, including uh, third party uh, application developers to be able to leverage those uh, uh, interfaces and, and, and really build out uh, additional uh, uh, capabilities. So again, at, as, at a high level, uh, what you see with, with the work that ONC is doing and, and some of the work that uh, uh, our colleagues in the standards community are doing is, is really build out the foundation 
so that uh, operational entities like HIEs and, uh, and, and health IT developers and third-party application developers would be able to leverage and, and really uh, build out uh, uh, capabilities to help uh, the health and healthcare of the, you know, of, of patients and, and, and really uh, provide these additional uh, uh, capabilities that are that 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 will answer uh, future future questions. I mean, again, so it's exciting. So these are foundational things that are happening, but but the hope is that uh, once the foundation is ready is done, uh, the the additional layers can can really build out based on 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 private sector uh, uh, interests and needs. Hope that I hope hope that kind of like gives at least a perspective. Thank you, Avinash. We have actually Dr. Suda, who uh, has some efforts to speak about in Singapore. And I believe I have unmuted you, Dr. Suda. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, April. Um, my name is Dr. Suda, and I'm speaking from UK, London. Uh, I, I worked with uh, Singapore Ministry of Health for a few years. We had uh, implemented lawing at a national level. Of course, you know, Singapore is a small country. It's not it's a very small place, but then, yeah, it, it was a huge effort, I would say. And I could resonate some of the problems that Vaishali has shared that labs are kind of, you know, the lab surveys revealed. Um, so it's really difficult for the lab people to really do the lab, uh, the law encoding, because they are too busy with their lab stuff. But they, they are the one who could provide the information if, if not for them the coding would be imperfect. So it's it's really a trade-off. You have to be involving them, but then they won't do the law encoding. They, are, they do not have, simply do not have the time, or they do not understand what a property is, even though they may be doing the lab tests. So it's, it's there, there needs to be a middle a ground or a middle team, which, because the information has to come from the lab teams. That's, that's how it is. And we were able to do that uh, from the ministry and we, again, uh, no offenses to lawing teams, but I think there's a lot to catch up with regard to trainings or uh, f for a common, uh, you know, people to be able to understand how lawing works. There are very few resources who are knowledgeable on lawing, I would say. So for labs, for them to, uh, I mean, I can, I can understand how it is in US if you have to leave the lawing coding to the individual labs or the uh, individual teams. Um, so that's some information I, I thought I would share. So we ha we from the ministry, few resources had to do the entire coding for the, all the labs and hospitals. So it, it was a humongous effort, but later we did some knowledge transfer and so that they could maintain their maps and updates and all that. So we came up with an entire end-to-end -end process and we did the handholding, did the initial lab coding and then pass down the labs and maps for them to maintain. So that, that's that's something I thought I would share. I know it's not at all a comparable uh, analogy between Singapore and US, I know, uh, but I thought uh, at the end of the day, the task is still coding. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing your yeah. experience in Singapore. Appreciate it. Yeah, and and Suda, Dr. Suda, thanks again. I think uh, this will be good uh, input for us as we work with the lawing team, uh, because again, uh, we've also heard that uh, there is a need for education in the mapping side, and and obviously there are tools like Realma that uh, lawing teams providing. So again, I think it's 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 good feedback. Uh, not sure we. You know, we are not, I, I don't think this group is 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 the the right group to provide uh, uh, the solution. But I think we can certainly I think as 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 ONC's uh, goal is to kind of bring to uh, the lawing team some of these feedback and and it helps to know that the feedback we got from the survey is consistent with what you are seeing in in the other part of the uh, world. Yeah, I am a clinician. I've been into health IT twenty years full time. I worked with all scripts and Cerner and throughout I was involved with uh, US healthcare. So uh, that's the reason I'm attending this session. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, I, I totally understand the problem, but there's a lot to be done in law and it's ever evolving. So you need to be really on the toast and catch up. Yeah. 
there's new stuff every day coming up like i am at to catch up on groups and a few stuff that's come re more recently yeah i think there needs to be a lot of more i i i something i don't know if we can discuss with lawing teams but there should be more educational trainings probably paid trainings i don't know or even the third parties could provide trainings and i'm sure the labs and you know uh, third i mean uh, companies in us who needs to be coding or hies they would be more than willing to get their resources trained because this it is very important that you get the right codes because if one lab is sending a code and the same test is coding coded differently then it's totally two different tests for a third person who is looking at it though in reality they both are the same test so getting the right codes is very important i think there's a lot of efforts going on but there i think with the amount of uh, you know i've been studying about the us cda and all that there is so much lab i mean lawing is involved in and um, we are just talking about lawing labs but there's so much on lawing clinical coming clinic clinical part of it coming up so i'm sure there is there's a dearth for training in lawing i could say from my experience been involved with lawing and snomed since many many years and this is what i can say snomed i think has trainings offered but lawing i i think should be offering some trainings paid that's fine but should be offering and i think we have to keep in mind this is Jamie Deckard i'm one of the <laughs> clinical terminology developers here on at loink i think we have to keep in mind the funding sources over the years and the size of the teams and yeah. how snomed's funded versus and what so i mean that definitely is you know what we wanted to provide um, it's just you know limited resources and and that's growing which is absolutely wonderful i think the recognition of what we're doing and what we need to do um, and then how we can support other people who are providing education. Um, and we've considered certifications and um, all of that is absolutely something we are very interested and in, willing to do. It's not that we don't want to do it or that we haven't even thought of it. It's definitely that um, it's more about the resources. I mean, I think when yeah, I started I, 10 I, years ago, I was the only content, you know, the terminology developer um, after a while. There was two of us and then there was just me for a little bit. Um, so it was a very, very small team, um, but we have grown, you know, over the years, which is just absolutely wonderful. So there will be, yeah, more and more support over the year, over the, you know, the, I, I agree that I agree to that, uh, you're very, very lean team and with the amount of visibility that Loink has in global community and especially US ONC, it's, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, this you yeah you guys are really really working on yeah a very, and we very have lean a, team i would say we have a you vast must be very number. stretched yeah well when we have a vast number of resources online it's just yeah helping people find those resources and then um i do think like to be frank i learned everything my myself i uh -huh. used lawing videos and i used to attend even from singapore all the midnight you know all the calls uh, so sopna maybe knowing if she remembers but uh, yeah i used to attend all these and it's all self learned uh -huh. and it's been few years but do you think when someone is uh, working on a project in us the lab team guys or you know those who needs to code uh, unless you are a really you know uh, expert or someone who knows about it a new person cannot really catch up it would take yeah years. definitely unless if they I... don't have lab lab knowledge yeah yeah it is a very complex space for sure clinical medical terminology in general is complex. Yeah. SNOMED, understanding SNOMED <laughs> is very ch yeah. challenging just as well. Um, but I, I agree, like a certification program or something that really, or, you know, gets people to read the information and learn it and show that they understand it um, would be useful as far as... Yeah, um, I serve a, on a lot of committees with HIMSS and then recently I worked on a new certification they're coming up with, uh, you know, Certified Health Transformation Specialist. Uh, similarly, maybe hims or someone should step in and maybe have some more, you know, hand holding. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know, probably because hims is, you know, the flagship for HIT, right, worldwide. Mm -hmm. And just <laughs> understanding not... terminologies in general. I mean, it's amazing how much people don't understand, like the syn the syntax or the, you know, like HL7 and fire and all of that. I mean, so to really pull together all the standards for semantics and then all the standards for messaging and it's just a broader thing than just LOINC. LOINC is just a small piece of it all. Um, and then LOINC mappings are key 
definitely in all of it in the semantics as well as the snowmed mappings for the answers the results so yeah it's all yep it's all really important Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it. So, you know, you helped uh, us not having to translate those comments to you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Great. And thanks. Thanks, Dr. Sudha. Appreciate your sharing your experiences. Yes, excellent. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we do have just a couple more comments. They're not questions, they're more comments. So, um, one of them is about the, our, the two codes that were released today. For any of our pre-release codes, you can go to loink.org slash pre-release and find them there. Um, and again, appreciation to Dr. Suda. Uh, and Andrea is advising that she was part of an ONC CDC funded laboratory interoperability cooperative team who aided 1,200 or more hospital labs with their LOINC and SNOMED CT needs for ELRs, um, but obviously needs still remain. Our in-person workshops were well received. Um, audio recordings will be available by the uh, end of the month, most likely. We will have these slides up by the end of the week. So that should conclude everything. Uh, and I, again, I want to give our great appreciation to the ONC team. So Avinash, uh, Vishali, Tracy, Dan, Rachel, and our two that snuck in later, Ryan and Andrew. Um, we are very happy to have had you here today with us. Uh, it's been a really great engaging discussion. Uh, if anybody has any additional questions, they can shoot them our way and we'll try to get them answered. All right, so we'll close out for the afternoon. And again, thank you to the ONC team. We've really enjoyed having you here today. Hey, thanks very much. Appreciate it. And again, appreciate all the questions and more importantly, appreciate your engagement in the standards work. It's, it's hard, but, but eventually <laughs> fruitful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you, Tracy. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.